Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to start off our, our webinar today by sending out a very special thank you to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority, who's made all of these webinars possible. Um, I'm really thankful that we're able to make a connection from, from so far away, uh, especially during this crazy time in the world. And um, I don't know what your day was like today or how your family is doing exactly, but I hope you're doing well. And why don't we all take uh, just a good deep breath before we've started? Maybe it's been a busy day and your hands have been full. And it would be good if we can relax so we can listen and think as best as we can. So um, one way I like to do that is to actually like squeeze your hands together. Squeeze as tight as you can while you take in a deep breath. And then as you let it out, let your shoulders relax and your arms relax. And there. This is also sometimes an easier way to teach um, children how to take a deep breath because often when we tell them to take a deep breath, they will start going, <laughs> which is not as relaxing. So having their, their, their muscles squeezed together is kind of a way to like bring in the deep breath and then to let it go. It just gives them a, um, a muscular pattern to follow. Um, but again, thank you everyone for being here to uh, follow this webinar on language support. Um, I have not met your children, so I am not sure exactly what fits them and exactly what you are looking for. So please, um, if you need something different or if you need to ask a question to make something more specific to your child's experience or your family's experience, please um, write those questions into the Q&A. And I will get to them um, as soon as I can or as soon as I can take a break. Uh, it really does help to make it more useful to you. And I will be um, giving out, um, you know, ideas here and there for things that you can do in your home. Um, I'm trying to make the most of this short period. But if you see an idea or a concept that you think really works well for your kids and you want to go and practice it or see if you can collect a few more materials, um, and ask for feedback, that's great. If you wanna just take the time to sit and listen and take notes so you can um, you know, work on some projects tomorrow, that's wonderful. Um, but I'm gonna start out by sharing my screen and just going over a few general concepts that I think um, are, are really important in language development, um, especially with kids who, who are learning language in all different ways. Uh, so let's see what we have here. So I think one of the very, very important things we need to remember is to always be practicing language at all levels. Um, we have a tendency to like want to push for the highest skill that we can get to, and that can be really important. We do need to introduce new skills and, and we do need to um, encourage you know, our kids to put in some effort and to try something new. But um, all, all kids um, need to practice language at different levels. So, they need to continue practicing language at an independent level, at a level that's very easy for them, and the instructional level where they're learning new skills. And one way I like to think of this that I think we might all understand is, um, now I'm a native English speaker, so when I'm speaking in English, I don't have to think about the words, I don't have to think about the grammar, that's all very automatic. So that means that I can focus on um, nuance, fluency, jokes, um, metaphors, like all the other different things that language opens up. Um, I can, you know, think about being funny or being specific or whatever. Um, when I'm practicing Spanish, where I'm still learning a lot of rules and a lot of vocabulary, it's very, very difficult for me to get the whole meaning because I'm just focusing on the words and the sentences and realizing that I missed sentences and getting frustrating. Um, and I've, I've also noticed that I have about a two hour window <laughs> in Spanish. And after that, um, I, I might have been speaking in the afternoon with somebody and they believe that I can understand them and we're communicating and then my brain will just stop and it's too tired to go any further. And then that same person will think, gosh, she didn't answer me. She, all of a sudden she, she's not speaking to me and people have thought that I was being rude or ignoring them. And it was really just that um, I got too tired <laughs> at, at, the, at the instructional level. Um, 
so we can keep this in mind for our kids. Um, it's really okay if they have simple language activities. Those, those can still be very rich and wonderful activities for them to learn from while they're also practicing some of these skills that are a little bit harder. So it's good. It's really good to be able to go back and forth. Um, and so one also really, really, really foundational, if you, if you take anything from this webinar, um, I think it's very important that we realize language must be attached to a real experience. When we give children a lot of vocabulary um, that's not focused on something that they, they can say, ah, this word goes to this object. <laughs> this word goes to this feeling. That's a match. That's, that's what that means. They have to have something real that they can sense that goes with the word. Otherwise, the word is kind of a wonderful sound. And a, I've known a lot of children. Um, there's one child in particular that I may um, refer back to a lot because I think um, this was a, a particular factor in his language development. Um, he, knew, he was very articulate, could put together wonderful, wonderful sentences and had a lot of ways of introducing himself and interacting verbally. But it was very hard for him sometimes to connect some of those words to his real experience. And I think that made him hard for him to tell people how he actually felt sometimes. Um, so it's, there's also been quite a lot of research um, where children's language comprehension and reading when they are at the, um, you know, when they get a little older and they're starting to read and trying to understand what they're reading, if they, don't have a lot of physical experience. You know, if they're reading a description of mountains and they've never seen a mountain, or if they're reading a description of, you know, riding in a car and they've never ridden in a car, it's very hard to comprehend that. So I would um, focus on like all those sensory experiences really are important to language. And I think one of the important things for, um, for us to remember is that when we're talking about um, stories and myths, those are all wonderful things. Like I think children should know all the, all the cultural stories from the place that they live. Um, they should know stories of their family history. They should have like myths and fairy tales and, and pretend things. Um, you know, I'm an artist, so I don't think we have to like say only, only facts are allowed, but it is something to remember. Um, when, a, when a child is hearing all this language, if they're not sure of, you know, are, are they talking about something that's happening now? Are they talking about something that's real? Are they talking about something that's pretend? Um, it can be very hard for a child who's just learning language and who might not have a, a strong concept of the difference between reality and pretend um, to put those words into context. So I think it's um, very, very important just to think about what is your child's um, concept of the world and what does it encompass and is for some children that's going to be the very present moment um, just really what's right in front of them and it's wonderful to make like creative language out of that and to practice language that's based just on what they can experience and as they get older we can focus on like yes this is what we're touching today um, this is what we touched yesterday <laughs> this is this is what we're going to touch tomorrow this is what your grandfather touched many years ago um, those concepts are very abstract and if you're it's so many concepts at once that it's really okay to start simply you're not going to be doing them a disservice by by letting them focus on what they understand and attaching the language to what they already know um, yeah and I also um, I note on this slide that collecting materials for sensory play from places that you've been can be a great way to connect maybe the past and the present or or things you know collections of things that we like. So if you have like a box of things that, you know, we went to the to a playground and we got some rocks. So we visited grandma and, you know, we brought something home from grandma's house. That's just a reminder, this belongs to grandma. We saw her yesterday. Um, that can be really helpful to have those things around just as uh, an object and a reminder of what you're talking about. Give it some context. Um, let's see, ah, and so in this, as, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of a couple of sensory bins um, of objects that might be more helpful for this um, beginning attaching the language to experiences so that we can talk about them. Um, I've 
I'm assuming that some of you have played with um, sensory bins or made a sensory bin for your home or maybe have seen them at your child's school. So it's just a bin, um, you know, with a high, high side so things don't fall out and make a mess. And they, they can be used, you can put anything you want in it for the child to explore um, sensory wise. Uh, they're really going to, you know, enjoy all the different textures and they're gonna be able to like work on their sensory integration. But when we're working on language, I start to get very picky about what I want to put in them. Um, and I thought this one, um, so if you were living in the United States, this one has a lot of very familiar objects that you might be able to relate to things that are outside. So um, if we have the dirt and we have these construction trucks um, and we have, you know, these are some little game pieces that we would always see. I don't know if they're as familiar where you are, but you might have suggestions of what um, your child would see every day that you could put a representation of into the box. This way, um, these things are recognizable. Your child can like call this a truck and then see a truck outside. I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's kind of a truck. It's a bigger truck, but it's kind of a truck like I have. Um, this is gonna make the language a lot more accessible. And I also would make sure um, to not, one of the ones that I like, a, things that I like about this sensory box is that it's very, very simple. It does not have a thousand things in it. Um, I was working with a young girl um, who was, she was completely blind and she was learning to speak. And she was very, um, she learned to, she used her, her speech normally when she was very, very excited. So I knew we had to have something that was going to be somewhat stimulating that was exciting for her. Um, so what we did was we just used the sink and filled it with soapy water and I had three or four objects that I would put in there whenever she came to the art room to visit. And we repeated a, a lot of the words over and over, but it was very familiar to her. Like, you know, she would splash and I would splash and we would talk about like, oh, I'm splashing. I splashed you. I splashed me. Like, did you feel the water? And she'd be like, yes, you know, like there, it's on my face. But there were so many opportunities for us to use these very, very simple things to stretch out the vocabulary, make jokes, um, talk about it being funny talk about what was, you know, what was uncomfortable if she couldn't find something or if her hand bumped something. Um, so there was a lot of expression in there, even though it's a very simple setting. And I think if there had been too many objects, it would have been confusing for her. It would have been a little overstimulating. Um, I think it was reassuring to her to be able to find the same things over and over. And that repetition can be so important. So even though this was a very simple setting, um, and I, I like this about this one. It's very simple. It has a lot of nice textures. It has natural materials. I always feel that um, natural material like sand and rocks or, or wood um, are much more pleasing and actually uh, seem to activate uh, a lot more interest from children sometimes than um, the plastic because it, it just doesn't have as nice of a texture. Um, also like everything has a different weight. Uh, engaging all of those senses is really important. So then I have another example of, so this is another example of a sensory bin that I found online. And I put this one in here because I was, I would not be as comfortable with this one for a child where I was using the bin to practice language or to practice like initial language, because there's a lot of things in here um, that I feel like could get very abstract <laughs> or that they might not recognize. And, um, you know, like obviously there's nothing wrong with the child's curious about outer space and they love outer space, you know, like why not talk about astronauts? But this is not, um, it might be too abstract because there are a lot of things that might be beyond their comprehension or beyond their daily experience. And it's gonna, they might remember the word like, oh, that's an astronaut but it's gonna be really hard to attach it to their daily life. So it's not like it's against the rules, but this box to me seems a little bit more complex than you'd wanna to give to a child who was like, really needed to connect their personal experience to the words. And I also feel like it's a little overstimulating. Like I would pick a few, <laughs> a few of those items and maybe focus on the color or the textures of the rice or, or the hand movements that they were using. Um, but I'm very happy to hear um, 
questions about that or suggestions or things of your your own child's preference um, as we go as we go forward um, I, I hope that's that's clear um, this was an activity that I did uh, with two children who had just come back from their summer vacation. Um, so we do have here in New York, we do have some beaches, even though that's not what we're famous for. <laughs> um, so several of the children who had come back for their first art group after summer had just been to the beach and they had this memory clearly in their mind. And this was a very important um, activity I felt for understanding point of view. Um, point of view is very important um, when we're, when we're talking about our child's experience with language and we're saying like, okay, maybe, you know, we're, we're both doing something together. And to me, this is very fun. Is it fun for you or is it uncomfortable for you? Are you having a good time? Okay, so am I. Um, having a shared experience or acknowledging that you might be having two different experiences um, is a really, really high level thought process. So if that's something that you can play with your child, that's wonderful. That's it's, it's a really, um, it connects so many parts of our experience. Um, I'm sorry, I may have to close the window if the construction continues. Um, let me know if that's a problem. Um, so what we did for this, actually these two boys were having a day where they were not happy to see each other after the summer vacation and they were disagreeing quite a lot. And, but they both had been to the ocean and they, so they sat across from each other. You can see that there is a, a tape line um, it was a little bit thicker when they started, but they had um, made a boundary <laughs> so that they each had their very own side. Um, and that's fine. That's like, that's actually a wonderful thing to do if they, if they need to tell people, I need some space. So they made a boundary for themselves so they'd know um, who was working where. Sorry, I am going to close this window for us. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so as I was saying, they had made a boundary through the middle of this cardboard thing. Um, one boy sat on the side with like all of the blue, shiny blue material. And then the other boy had sat on the side with all of the sand and seashells. And they both remembered like what they had experienced most at the ocean. So the boy on the, on the side with the, the sand and the seashells, he remembered sitting in the sand, he remembered collecting some things. Um, that helped him to remember that he'd also been sitting with his family and he could tell me a little bit about what his family was doing that day. And the other boy, what he remembered most was the water and um, imagining that there were animals swimming in it. So those orange pieces symbolize the fish. And, um, and of course, like there's some dolphins down there that I helped him to cut out and he remembered the sun. These were all like, they had very, very different memories and they were able to talk about being at the same place and having these different memories together. And also having very different moods. They also expressed that like, um, the boy with the sand and the shell said that he wanted it to be a very calm morning. He wanted things to be very still. And so he worked very hard at like gluing down all of his seashells. Um, and then his, his friend who was, um, really thinking about the water said he wanted it to be very exciting. He was very excited at the beach. And so he wanted to have all of these um, shiny things and animals and moving parts. So it was very interesting because when they, you know, when they came in, I think this was part of their disagreement during the day that one of them wanted to be quiet and the other one wanted to be a little bit louder, but they managed to have their own space and each tell their own experience through this. And I think it, it had to include a lot of like the physical experience of their memory um, but I thought this was a great activity because they were each able to tell each other how they felt, how they felt about it and um, what they enjoyed and what they wanted. Yes, I will, I will, there's one other window. Hold on just one moment. All right, I think, I think that will happen 
uh, that will help a little a little bit. Um, so this is something I think that could be done, um, you know, if you have siblings in the house and they're having a hard time communicating, or if you just want um, kids to talk about like, what did we do yesterday? What did we do when we went to visit that person? Um, what do you remember touching and feeling? Um, and this is a great way to share experiences and realize we were both in the same place and had a totally different experience and different memories. And that helps, that, that really helps kids when they're communicating to know that like, um, you know, a lot of kids can assume that everyone else is feeling the same thing I am. You know, they, they don't know yet that that's not true. Um, so it, that can create a lot of misunderstandings. And, and so this can be really helpful um, to create some kind of conflict resolution or just to share memories in a happy way. And uh, it's, a, it's a great communication support. Let's see. Uh, and this, um, this one was sort of a research project for us. Um, I was working with two boys. I was working with the, um, the boy that I mentioned who was very, very, very art articulate, but was having sometimes having a hard time connecting language to his own experience and his own feelings. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, he could speak very, very clearly. He was, he picked up vocabulary very, very, very easily. And, it, you know, there's a wonderful thing that his mom taught him. Um, she had taught him to tell all of these jokes, all these very simple jokes that he could introduce himself with. So he could go to, um, walk into a room where he didn't know anyone and just, just tell a joke. And it, you know, instantly then people would respond or try to answer and he, he'd have a way to be comfortable and other people could be comfortable with him and understand what he was saying. Um, so he had a lot of great conversations with people this way and it was a really fun and wonderful thing. But I, I also notice, notice sometimes he'd, um, he'd be working um, with art materials and he would be talking and talking and talking about his favorite words and how they're spelled and his hands would stop moving and I realized, okay, we're, we're only in one part of our brain now. We're just using, we're using the words, but they're kind of detaching from what we're actually doing. So I would say, okay, Jonathan, like, what are your hands touching? Um, and you could see him shift gears. All of a sudden his voice would get very slow and very deep and he really, had to concentrate. It was like he was going all the way back at, down into his body and putting his hands on whatever he was working with and he'd say, ah, oh, it's very sticky. There's a lot of glue. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm like, yes. How does it feel on your hands? It's so sticky, you're right. That's, I feel it being sticky too. Um, and I, so, I, I really worked to try to like help him focus on like, what are your hands doing? How are, your, how are you connected to the things around you? Also, um, Jonathan couldn't see, so it was really important for him to be able to find contact through, through touch. Um, but in, I picked this example of work that I did with him and a, and a friend of his who was, who was also blind. Um, because this was an example of how difficult it was for him to make a picture of the world um, from all of this vocabulary without um, having a context or a picture of it in his mind. So he would say, um, you know, we would, this was again, like we come back from summer vacation and all of the kids are, and the staff are talking about, oh, I went to visit my family here, you know, at the beach. And I went to visit my family over there in the mountains. And I went to visit my family, um, in the desert, you know, down here. And it was, both he and his friend had a very difficult time. They're like, where are these places? How did they get that? How far away are they? You know, can we go? And they didn't have a way of putting in their mind um, all of these things that they were hearing. They were just kind of floating around and they, they couldn't build concepts around them. And it was getting very confusing. And they were, he, was, he was very, very obsessed with like, how, how do all these things fit together? So we made this giant, cut out cardboard um, of, you know, part of the United States and then started, you know, just started to be able to feel it and think about, okay, this is where we are in New York. We made New York with all the little beads. So we started making, um, marking some of the cities with beads. Um, we put in the major highways <laughs> because people were talking about which highway they drove on. And then we could say, ah, oh, you know, if you go far enough down here, you'll get to Florida. Um, I also started, um, 
helping them choose different textures that we could add to show <clears throat> different climates that people were um, we're traveling to. So we had the sand for the desert. We had a lot of rice for places where they grow crops. I mean, I was just using whatever we had. So um, I would love to do this again with different, different types of supplies. Um, you see all the, the clay pieces are supposed to show mountains. And this went on for weeks, weeks and weeks. <laughs> we would meet um, once a week all together and like retouch everything that we'd, that we'd made before. Um, and we would you know, talk about like, yeah, that's where, you know, Sandy went to Florida. San, you know, this is, this is how she got down, follow, you know, follow the highway. And then talking a lot, um, once we had this, it was a little bit easier to talk about scale, about things being far away and how long it would take to get there. And this was really helping them to put in a few of those concepts that they were missing. Um, uh, another time, another thing that we did, which is like one of my favorite memories, which I don't have a, a a picture for unfortunately um, is that both both of these children who couldn't see and several others that were blind also could not have um, a mental image of a lot of things like animals um, and so they had a really hard time with this type of vocabulary and understanding you know where they would from or where they would be or or what they look like so we were actually able to go to a person who kept taxidermied animals um, you know who were it's just like the skin and the the heads like um, and, and they let us touch all the animals so that they could feel like how many legs they have, where their claws go, you know, what shape their ears are, how thick is their fur. That really helps them to like understand and to make comparisons. But it just really impressed on me how important it really is to have that sensory experience first and then attach the word to it. Um, the words will just be floating if we don't have that experience. All right, so um, going back just to that idea, it's just stories in the present moment. Um, and just because we're talking about a simple setting doesn't mean that these aren't complex skills. And it doesn't mean that they're not, um, that they won't lead to more complex activities. So if we have, um, if you're just sitting in the moment with, with your child and you're sitting, you know, maybe on something that's soft or maybe that's something that's hard, you just, like, okay, what am I feeling like, oh, you know, like it's a really fuzzy cover. You know, I feel like I'm sinking down into the pillow. Um, you know, that door over there is closed. Like, I wonder what's behind it. Like, start with these immediate experiences and notice your sensations and also notice if you have separate sensations. You know, maybe it's uncomfortable to the child to be like wrapped up in, you know, in a, in a big, fluffy thing. Maybe it feels like too much is touching them. And, and so you could say like, oh, you know, I think it's really comfortable, but you think it's very different. You know, you, you would like to get up from here. Um, just noticing those things can be the beginning of a, of a story um, and the beginning of a memory because you've, you've shared it together. Um, and so getting back to that, you know, that point of view, you can, you can practice that point of view, which is such a big part of storytelling and understanding characters' motivations, um, just from understanding your own motivations during the day. You're like, oh, I love tasting this soup. Do you love tasting this soup? Oh, you, you think the soup doesn't taste very good. <laughs> like, so we both have a very different feeling about this. Um, that's a great discovery. And like I said before, a very higher level thinking skill. So it is, um, even if you come about it simply, it's still a really, really important work. Um, let's see. Um, yes, and describing, oh, okay, um, let me go back to this other one for Describing what you think someone else is noticing um, is also a really important storytelling, even if you're talking about like your family and what they're doing during the day, and it's um, very simple, like, wait a minute, what is your brother doing right now? Ah, do you think he wants to play a video game? I think he wants to play a video game too. How do we know? Is it, you know, because he's, because he's looking for the controller or, um, I think your little brother is looking for a snack. How do you think he's feeling? They, that's really good practice. I would go, um, I would just, that's an activity where I would just open the door and, mm -hmm. and see what happens. I, I wouldn't like put a lot of pressure on them to give a correct answer. You're just opening the, this is an important question. Let's enjoy this question. Let's keep this question going. Um, 
just give them as many opportunities to think about it and to narrate it as you can. And I also um, will often um, tell stories about children while they're, while they're sitting next to me. Occasionally they don't like it. And so if they look uncomfortable, I can say, oh, I'm sorry, you, you don't want me to talk right now. Um, but sometimes you can tell they start listening. <laughs> so if I, I might just say like, oh, you know, um, Jonathan came in today and he wasn't really feeling like working. I wonder if maybe he was tired. Um, maybe he'd like to put his head down for a minute. Um, gosh, I wonder what made him so tired today. Um, well, now I can see he's decided to go and get some work and we're gonna go, oh, I'm so curious about what he's gonna find. Sometimes they'll notice that you're talking about them and they'll get a little bit excited about it and it's kind of nice to have um, an audience. And like I said, if they if they don't enjoy it, I'll just say, okay, you want some privacy <laughs> and, and I'll back off. But, but it is one way for them to notice that, um, to see themselves and have that reflection and, and have words for what they're doing. Um, I would say then, um, also once you have like the sort of routine about making little stories in, in real life and in the, in the real moment, um, it's really great to have maybe drawings or photos of the things that you had talked about before. This is making it a little bit more abstract. So if you take, um, if you say like, okay, we went to grandma's um, and you have a couple pictures of grandma's house and you can just put them together on a couple pieces of paper so you can take them out and, and sort of read them like a book. And like, we went to grandma's house. Um, this is what grandma made. Like, what else did we do at grandma's house? Um, what do you remember? Or, you know, did we sing a song? Um, this way we can, we can have a story in the context of their life. And now we're making it very, very, it doesn't seem very abstract, but it is very abstract in those initial conversations to be talking about something that happened before that's not happening where we are right now. Um, and to be able to organize it in your mind that that was before, it's not happening right now. This is what's happening right now. And maybe in the future we will go to grandma's again. What would we like to do next time we go to grandma's? Those are really <laughs> essential concepts and they're not always easy to get. Um, so if you, if you have any questions about that or how that would be um, relevant to your child um, or how to make it more specific to them, like you can put the, the questions in. Um, Let's see, I also wanted to, um, this is just a quick activity that I wanted to introduce to you. I know this, the, the last time I presented that we did have some Montessori teachers in the group. And so I don't know, um, this might be familiar to a few of you, but it's a very, very simple way to introduce new vocabulary. If you feel like your child's needing some review, if you're like notice that you're talking about a lot of things and, and, and they're just not getting the words that you've practiced all the time together. Um, it's very simple. You just first, like the adult, um, will name an attribute or a descriptive word, then the child will choose it, and then the child will name it. But you need to start out very specifically. Um, so for this example, I have these two bottles of ink. They're exactly the same size. They're exactly the same shape. Um, the only thing that's, they actually are also about the same weight. So the only thing that's different about them is the color. Now, if one was a different size and a different color, and I said, this is blue, it might be hard for some children then to realize or if I'm describing the size or if I'm describing the color. So this is why it's very important that you have like just one difference. That way it's easily observable to the child what word <laughs> it is, um, what word is going to which attribute. So if I say, you know, and then we just have some fun. So like, this is the blue ink. I have the blue ink in my hand. Would you like to hold the blue ink? What are you holding? You're holding the blue ink. This is the red. This is the red ink. It's so pretty, I love the red ink. Would you like to hold the red ink? Can I have the red ink back? Okay, now I have the red ink. That's great, do you wanna look at the red ink closely? We just repeat over and over and over. As not to, not to torture them, but <laughs> just as long as it's fun. And then, um, we ask them to choose. So if I'd say, okay, can I have the blue ink back? And they say, oh, which one is the blue ink? And if they can choose it successfully, then we continue, okay, oh, I have the blue ink and I have the red ink. Which, which one is the red ink? And have them choose, ah, this is red. Okay, so now I know that they've, they've realized that like this is blue and this is red somewhere in their mind. Um, and they're starting to make that connection. If 
if it's not working, we just go back to the first step or we smile and say like, that was a lot of fun and we put it away for the day. So maybe they've gotten to their frustration level. The, if the second step, if they're able to easily choose like which one is red, which one is blue, then we can start asking them, huh, would you like to hold this? What are you holding? So I'm not saying red anymore. Now it's up to them to say red and they have to remember the word, bring it back up and pronounce it and say it. And so they've done all the work now themselves. They can say, this is red. They can say, oh, I was holding, you know, I had the red ink and the blue ink. Wait, what was this? Um, would you like to hold it? What are you holding? <gasps> You're holding the blue ink. So, and um, you can see I've also used the word in a lot of different sentence structures. So we're placing the word in, um, in questions and statements. So that's also going to be a lot of, a lot of really good practice. It's a very simple thing. Um, you can use it with things in the kitchen. You can use it with things, um, you know, that you find outside, just as long as you're focusing on one, one attribute. This is just one way to really simplify vocabulary for kids who like just, you know, who are very young or just really need that extra reinforcement. And there's a, there's a website down at the bottom of this uh, slide, the Montessori notebook.com. They had a lot of references. Um, if you would ever like to go to that website, they have a lot of very good like isolated language activities that you could try at home or make for yourself at home. Um, let's see. And go to this next one. Um, so these are also some very simplified uh, activities that you can do, which you, you might already be doing. Um, I just wanted to, to mention them quickly because again, they are deceptively simple. So we are, there's, there's an object to object matching activity on the left. And this activity um, you know, is mostly sensory perception, just being able to notice the differences, being able to notice um, all of the things that we want to describe later. And on the right, there's an activity that is matching an object to a picture. And again, this seems very simple, but there are a lot of very important concepts in there and you're now making a very concrete sensory activity into an abstract one. So it really is a big jump. Um, there are tons and tons of activities like this that you can order like pre-made where they have all the little objects in the pictures and it's very easy and certainly a wonderful thing you can do with your kid if they like it. Um, but one way that I think you could make this a little more connected to their experience and still make it more abstract is to use those photographs of things in your home. So again, if you go for a visit or if you even like make a book of photographs of things from your house that are like your child's favorite things or things that they don't like <laughs> and put them all together, um, that might be an easier way. And they could even carry them around and like say, oh, this is the picture of the chair. Oh, this is the picture of my, you know, my dad's shirt. This is the picture of um, the lemons and place them on the things in the house. I think that might actually help make it com combine like their concrete experience and the abstraction. And that might really help them to be able to realize, ah, oh, a, a lot of these words that we have stand for something else. It's not necessarily happening right now. It stands for something else. Um, but it also stands for something that I know. <laughs> um, and I know, I know I'm talking about a lot of things. I feel like I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you. So please, um, if you have a question or if you just have an activity that works really well for your own child, or if you've been trying something and you're not sure, um, you know, how it's going and, and you want some suggestions, please, you know, please, of course, give, put those in the, the questions. Um, so I also wanted to talk about research activities because I feel like this is a, a language activity for a lot of children that has been very, very, very important. Um, I've spoken with a lot of children who have very high level language actually, and they are, um, they will find something that maybe is a little bit stressful to them. Like for, for one instance, um, I met an older boy um, who could read and write very well. He was very, um, he was very articulate. He was very, very concerned about the sounds of babies crying. Um, it caused him a lot of distress um, as it's meant to do. <laughs> um, he really did not understand why they needed to make this very loud sound and why were they so sad and what was going on. And so he independently did a lot of research 
um, he went on YouTube and Googled babies crying and, you know, saw videos of babies crying and then, you know, researched why do babies cry? And he did this over and over and over and over again. Now, a lot of um, people might call this um, perseverating. They might say like, oh, they're repeating this too much. We shouldn't repeat things like that. That's not normal. But it's actually what a lot of people do when they feel anxiety. We perseverate a lot on things when we have anxiety. And for, for, this, um, for this young man, he was really trying to understand. It wasn't something that he was doing that was random um, or that was in the way of, of learning. It, he was intentionally researching and trying to understand. Why do babies cry? Why does it hurt my ears? <laughs> what do we do about it? And he learned a lot and he, he created like all these folders of you know, facts on why babies cry. And after a while, he did understand it better. And he felt like, you know, if a baby's crying, that's okay. They're just asking for help and somebody will help them. And if it bothers me, I, I can leave the room. <laughs> so he figured out a way to deal with it that way very independently. And I think that's something for us to remember too, like that repetition might be very meaningful. It, it's not always random. It's not always a problem. Um, I also know a, a young girl who um, she found bug poison in there in the building and her, you know, her mom was very shocked, like, oh my gosh, don't touch that. That's, you know, that's very dangerous. And, and this became a big question to her, like, why would we put dangerous things in our building? And why are we killing bugs? And what is poison? And, you know, so she asked constantly, and I'm sure if someone's at home asking you the same question, over and over and over, um, it can start to feel like it's, it's not meaningful. But it was portraying like how much concern she had about it, um, how many questions she had about it. And so we did talk about this over and over and eventually it wound up branching into a whole research project about plants and some plants are poisonous and sometimes that helps them and sometimes they're too poisonous. And you know, what else is poisonous and why? And is, is it a protection or is it a harm? And we got into some very big questions just by giving her the time to, um, to ask the question over and over. And I think she also had to start the conversation by asking the same question. That was just kind of the starting point. And then we could go into all the new information. So I, I just wanted to add this because I think sometimes this, um, th these research activities are sometimes seen as something that's, um, you know, a waste of time or, or like not, not something they should be doing. And I, I think you really can encourage it. I think sometimes there's the worry that like, oh, if we encourage this, they're just going to keep asking the same question over and over forever. And it probably will go on for a long time, but it can be very meaningful. They can get something out of it. And you could learn a lot also about what they're thinking and how they're thinking. And, and it could even lead to a new interest. So I, I would definitely think that's um, a really important activity. Um, if you have any particular interests that your children have been trying to <laughs> research or ask about over and over, um, you can also add that in the, in the questions and we'll get to it. Um, so this was an art activity, again, with the, the student, Jonathan, and I thought this was a wonderful way that he used storytelling to come to understand um, something about something that really troubled him also. Um, again, so he was able to be, you know, start conversations and chats with people all the time and, and be very articulate and make a connection with them. But he did have a really hard time describing his own feelings and his own sensations. So we went through a very, very long process to get to that point. And one of the things, um, so when I was working with Jonathan, I worked at a school um, and a lot of uh, graduate students would come to work with us during the year, but they would, they would only stay for a little while. They would stay for a few months. And so, you know, after that, you know, he would get to be friends with them and then they would have to leave and say goodbye. And, and after the, you know, the third or fourth time, the starters kind of weigh on him. He was like, I really wonder where they went and why don't they come back? And why do they say goodbye? And it was very, very troubling. And I think he really genuinely missed them. So he started to make um, these figurative images of him. And this is the really the first time he independently made figures. I had um, introduced it like repeatedly and he was not very interested. Um, he preferred, you know, other things like letters and numbers that he was really interested in. Um, 
but this really made him think like, I, I want to remember, you know, my teacher Lauren. So you can see like the red rectangle is her, her body and um, you know, the, the white and the orange are her arms and uh, the blue, uh, her legs. And then up there that, that yellow circle was, you know, her head. And he, he gave everyone a different kind of hat or hair. Um, but it was, and, and you can also note here that there's a different texture paper for most of the, the parts of the body. That was also to help him um, because he was not able to see to, to be able to tell like which piece was which while he was working. Um, so he made this image of, of Lauren and it really clicked with him. Like, this is a picture of her. <laughs> this is like how I'm remembering her. And we got to have this incredible conversation about what it was like to remember somebody who's not here anymore. So, um, when I'm telling you about like first, you know, we just, we have the real experience in the present directly. And then later um, you have the step of telling your child like, oh, what did we do yesterday? Um, what was that like? What do you remember? Um, what's, what's in your mind now, even though they're not here? That's a huge revelation. Um, so he, he was like, yeah, I remember like this, these are the projects we worked on. Um, I, you know, I would see her on Tuesdays, like he would bring up all of this information. And he would also say like, I, I, I'm feeling sad that she's not here. And he was able to use this to connect to his own feelings. And then he would also make up a lot of stories of where he thought Lauren went. So we could say, well, we actually don't know for real, but we can imagine where she might be. And so he would imagine her doing some things that were very realistic, like um, doing some homework, or um, maybe working at another school. Um, and then he also was able to joke <laughs> and make up things that he didn't think that she would really be doing. Like, you know, maybe she went to Brazil, maybe she went to this. <laughs> um, and so we could joke about it and laugh knowing that the, those were kind of unrealistic um, because we're, we're working on this very simple level of language for him. But also to say like, we're kind of sad that we don't know. We're just kind of, it's kind of sad that we don't know where she is. Um, so it was, it was amazing. And then he used this again, like he made a complete collection of all of the teachers that had come to work in the room that had visited for a while and left. And so he had like a whole book of all the teachers and then was able to use each picture to say, oh, um, this, yeah, this one, this one was Jennifer and this is what we did with Jennifer. And she was here the year I was in this class. And, um, you know, these are, the, I remember her voice being like this and it was really, really important for him to be able to, I think cognitively and emotionally, this was a, a huge activity for him. And I, I honestly did not initiate this. Like I said, I, I tried many times to introduce the idea of like making a figure. Um, and, and it was just not of interest until he was missing a person and he wanted to make that person. Uh, so I thought this was really, really crucial. Um, for him and and it went on like I said it went on for a long time and I think he continued to use it as a tool for when there were people that he was missing um, so let me see are there any does anyone have an example of something that they work on at home that they might be able that we might be able to um, share or Um, you know, or, or if there are materials in your home that you think would be useful. Um, if not, I can continue giving some examples, but I want to make sure that we have a, a chance and we don't, don't miss the questions. Um, so let me see. I also like um, songs might be particularly of interest. Um, they are also, it's a, a completely different area of the brain as well when you're using songs. So sometimes singing can be a really great way to introduce um, new words and new sensations and new memories. Uh, and it can also help children sometimes articulate a little bit better. But it is, yeah, songs, if the, you have any favorite songs, um, <laughs> you want to share them on the chat, I will, I will share them with everybody else. Um, they're also a great way of sharing like cultural history and cultural experience and family experiences because they're they're passed down. So we have that sense of continuity. So always use those. Um, I have noticed um, 
that a lot of times I'll have a child come into the room and they will start singing um, or humming. And I can sort of recognize the tune, but I can't understand the words. And I'm not sure why this is, but they will have, um, they'll, I don't know if like when they're singing it to themselves, like they don't, it, it doesn't seem necessary to pronounce, pronounce all of the words, but if I can sing along with them and sing the words, they will then start pronouncing all the words and sing along with me. Um, it's just an interesting observation that I've made, but I think like singing along with the children so that they can hear your pronunciation and they know that you're sharing the song is very important. Um, and that's, yeah, I'm seeing two, yes. Yes, yeah, storytelling is also very effective. And I think this is, um, important. I know that this uh, webinar is a lot about storytelling and I feel like I've given like a lot of building blocks for the language that al allow storytelling um, because I feel like sometimes we, we jump to a very abstract story and then it's hard for the child to connect to everything. But I do think, um, you know, talking about your day as if it was a story is a great way to engage a lot of emotion. Um, I think introducing um, stories and then possibly making them like translating them maybe to your daily life. Like if, if um, let me see, what is a, a good story that we would do? I mean, if we were talking about, I don't know if everyone knows the story of, of Pinocchio, but like Pinocchio was a little wooden boy and he wanted to be a real boy and he wound up going through all these dangerous adventures. And so if you could make, um, you know, little objects or if you could even have like members of the family play the parts to tell the story like a little play that could be really really fun um, and it could make it a little bit more concrete and more personalized also as far as uh, storytelling one thing that I did not get to put um, into the, the PowerPoint presentation was uh, we had a radio theater program at my school so what that means is that we had um, we recorded our voices we had microphones and we had sound effects. And then we would tell the story and use all of the sound effects. And this was really great because some of our, our kids who really understood the story but had trouble pronouncing um, could work on the, the sound effects if they were tired of talking. And then other kids who were really interested in talking could focus more on, on verbalizing. And, and you know we would switch roles every now and then so people had lots of practice. But we, had, we would have a script and a routine and we would have the kids build on it um, little by little. Like, okay, so um, where is this going to be? It's going to be on a farm, okay. How many sounds are we gonna have to come up with? Um, who's gonna make the sounds? Are you gonna make the sounds with your mouth or are you gonna um, use something to bang on? Like, how will you make those sounds that go with the story? And this was also really important, even if they weren't telling the story or doing the speaking parts, they still had to listen and understand when it, when it was funny or important for them to make their sound. So they're still following the story and getting the feeling of it, which was really um, good. And we, you know, you get to rehearse when you do theater, so we could repeat and repeat. And I remember um, Jonathan, the boy I was telling you about who did um, the pictures and the map, um, he had, he knew his lines very well. It was very hard for him at first to understand the timing. And it was very hard for him at first to understand like, the vocal expression, you know, um, and how he should use that and when he should use it. So we did a lot of practice and it seemed at first very, you know, like we're telling, you know, just explaining things to him about like the voice or like, is your character angry? Is he trying to find these people? What's happening? Um, and eventually like he got into it and he was then able to start making the jokes, but he really needed all that repetition to tell that story over and over um, so that the environment of the story was easy to understand and the timing was easy to understand. And then he was able to come up with all of these different um, additions. Um, also, it was very, it was a really nice way for the kids to get comfortable and then share personal stories that made them feel um, more understood. And I feel like that, that part of storytelling where we have, um, we have the creative aspects um, and we have like a really personal aspect come in it's like bringing all the parts of your mind and your experience together. It's, it's such an important thing. And it's also something we can't force the kids to do. We just have to give them the environment so that they can try. So one of our students, um, I see some people are 
raising their hands and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to check on that or if the tech is okay. Um, here, let's see. Is, uh, hold on, I, let me, um, let me see if there's something. Ask, oh, okay, I can ask them to unmute. So if you've, if you've raised your hand, can you unmute so that you can, um, so that you can ask your question? Okay. Uh, Flor de Lisa, can you unmute yourself or, if, and that way you can ask your question? I'm ready when you are, if you're able to, I can't hear you yet, but. Yes, miss. Okay, hello, you had a, you had a question? No, uh, no, I don't have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, was there, there was someone else who had a, a question? Oh, Latifa, uh, Latifa Saif, if you can unmute yourself, I can hear your question. Let me see, I don't know if I can, if I can do it for you. Latifa, are you there? Okay, I'm not sure if she's there right now. So Latifa, if you come back, please um, put your question, uh, raise your hand again, or just um, put your question in the Q&A and we'll get back to it. Um, but I'll just um, continue with the story that I was telling you about the, the radio theater. Um, so we did have like this practice of making a script that we made together and was very simple um, and that we would repeat and follow until all the kids understood the timing, understood their cues, um, paying attention to so many things at once. And once we got this to be a, a comfortable routine, um, one of the students decided that he wanted to make his own play and he wanted to give everyone parts and he was going to write it and share it with everybody. And this was a, a student who was also completely blind. It was the, the boy that was working with, with Jonathan. And it was really frustrating to him when people were always on their phones because he couldn't see what they were doing on their phones and he couldn't talk with them when they were on their phones. And he was feeling a little bit alone. So he made the story about himself walking on the beach. Um, everyone helped make sounds for the ocean because um, they now all share this memory of being at the ocean and they could all agree on what it would sound like um, and what, kind, oh, it was a windy day, it was a sunny day, what would it be like there? They were able to share all those experiences. And then um, we also like all worked together to make the sounds of all of our phones beeping at the same time and that they would drown out the sounds of the ocean. And this was a very sad thing in the play. And he was able to say very, you know, with quite a lot of emotion, hey, no one is listening to me. <laughs> no one is listening to me because they're all on their phones and they are not playing with me. And, and we'd say like, you really need to listen. And it, it was in a play, but it was a very sincere question. And they had all worked together to make this play. And we did build up to that quite a lot, but I felt like it was, um, it was a safe place to tell the story because it was, sort of pretend um, when we can tell when we can use pretend stories it doesn't feel as real it doesn't feel like we're hurting someone's feelings so it's a little safer for us then to be able to express um, a frustration or or anger in this way we don't think we're going to hurt somebody or make them feel bad um, but we can still get our point across which is very important um, and there was they were able to feel like a lot of support around the stories they created because everyone in the in the group was also helping like what kind of sounds do you want when do you want me to talk like when um you know is this is this the right volume like what do you want um so it was extremely helpful and we we really 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 enjoyed having that program but we also had a program for the younger students who i think might have been really confused by some of the 
abstract language that we were using in that group. So for the younger students, I tried to talk about things that were just happening in the room at that time, or that we would um, use a sound and like pass it around and talk about what was happening there. And that was our foundation. And there's no reason to believe that, you know, that that younger group of kids wouldn't have been able to go on and tell stories. Actually, they did love to tell stories about um, ambulances and emergencies that were they loved exciting stories. So we told a lot of exciting stories. Um, but I had to be careful because um, one time we were using um, different sound props and one of them was like a, a rapper. And one of the kids heard, you know, the, the cookie wrapper and was like, we're having cookies. And I was like, no, you know, it's pretend there's no cookies. We're just thinking about the cookies. And that was too much and not fair. <laughs> and he really did not enjoy that. Um, so that's what I'm saying when like sometimes because you just have to be aware of like their context and what will be confusing if they're if it's easiest for them to understand what is happening in the world right in front of them right now start with their storytelling there and and then expand it because they can get a lot of mixed up cues about what is happening right now um, and they can hear a lot of language about something that's happening far away and think are you describing what's happening right here in front of me and those words don't match and it gets very confusing. Um, I think one, one good example of this is that when I was working with children who were, um, who were visually impaired, um, a lot of times people would describe to them things that are happening around them um, visually. Like, you know, there's lots of green plants, there's, there's a white um, potted plant and there is, um, you know, there, there's a window and, and the light's coming through and this can be really helpful because they want to know what's going on around them. But for the kids who had never seen the plants um, and who had never seen uh, the pots, like it didn't mean much to them. They would have, and they also, um, you know, were describing things in color, like this is what we're sensing, but that's not how they would sense the room. They needed to know how much space was in the room. They needed to know um, what it felt like to touch the plants. They needed to know if it was safe to touch the plants. So, when I talk about like describing the world in the child's context, really look at their point of view. Because if I have um, a child who's blind and I, I give them this bottle of glue and I say, this is a bottle of white glue. And what they feel is smooth plastic, they're attaching the word white to smooth. And that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that, that's gonna be horrible for them when, they're, when they hear people talking and the words they're describing aren't matching up with the meaning that they have. So yes, be creative and talk about a lot of different things, um, use a lot of different levels of language, but when you are matching a word to an experience, make sure you're matching the words to the child's experience, and then you can grow from there. Um, let's see if there's a question here. Nope, not quite yet, okay. Um, I wonder just, since we have a little bit more time for the, the Q&A questions, if you could let me know maybe how old some of your children are so I could give some specific examples. Or, um, or if there's a sp particular skill that they're working on or um, something you've tried at home, that way we, I can give you some feedback maybe that's more related to, to your family. And let's see, in the, in the meantime here, what do we have? Um, we have that we can use. Okay, so um, I'm also going to talk about, um, you know, children acting out movies, uh, which is also something that, um, for me, it does seem like the language in the movies can be a little bit divorced from their actual real experience. And when they're, when they're repeating the lines, it may just be repeating the lines as if they were music, as if they're beautiful sounds and not necessarily language. Um, not necessarily anything wrong with that. That's completely fine. Um, but I think also sometimes there's a way to make those words more meaningful. So if you have a child who loves a particular movie or who loves a particular TV show and they're repeating those lines over and over and over, um, repeat them with them and see if you can find a way to act them out. It, it might take a lot of um, effort, you know, and, and like slow introductions, uh, so that you can try and, um, you know, integrate it. They might have a routine they really love and they don't want to mess it up. Um, right, someone just raised their hand. 
Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself so you can ask a question. Oh wait, but I think it may have gone back down. Okay, so I'll, you can um, feel free to unmute yourself or, or write your question if I missed you. Okay, um, so another thing that we did uh, is, oh wait, here we have, we have a question here. Um, oh, so you have a younger, okay, so I see Latifah that um, you have a younger uh, sister who is, um, is following everything that the older sister is doing. So, and this is, this is also really common. We've also had um, some situations. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who their, her youngest sister wasn't speaking um, and she was starting to get old enough that they were like, maybe she should be speaking now. What, sh what should we do? And so they went a family, they were seeing a family therapist and the family therapist said like, just bring in all of the sisters, bring in all the sisters at once and we'll play a game. And what the family therapist noticed was that the youngest child never had to speak independently because the older sisters would just assume, would just say, oh, this is what she needs. Um, and, and she never learned to ask for things because other people were always anticipating what she wanted. Um, so they really had to teach the older children, like stand back, wait until she asks, give her a chance to do something by herself. Um, um, this is a this is a good question, uh, Latifa. And is it like I'm assuming it's okay for me to um, say this? Like, so Latifa is saying that um, her her older daughter um, has Down syndrome, and that her younger daughter is imitating like a lot of what she does and the way she talks. And she wants to know um, if she can explain to her daughter that her older sister has special needs. And I think that's a very very important question that I think a lot of people. Are really wondering how do we talk to um, our siblings and and other children in the family about the expectations that we have for the other kids? How to tolerate them? Why do they why do they sometimes get to do things that we can't do? Um, that can be really um, it's it's a very long conversation. It will probably go on and and change a lot as the girls get older. Um, you know, your four year old will start to notice that she can do some things maybe that her older sister can't do. Um, and, and both of the girls will probably have a, a response to that. But I, I think it, it's okay to start that conversation now and to say like, you know, there's, it's probably okay to, to talk with her sister in, in the way that she hears her sister talking. Maybe that's something they can share or maybe something they can understand. But you can also maybe tell your younger daughter, let's let's teach her some songs and let's teach her a story and let's um, there's things you can teach her also, so that maybe then um, she doesn't feel like she always has to copy. She can also introduce something. Um, she can have her her own things that maybe her sister would like to to learn from her. Um, that might be a helpful way to start. And then like little by little, like kids will have questions, and I think it's it's okay to just answer them very matter of factly, like. It's okay for everybody to have their own, um, you know, abilities and their own interests. And so we can simply like explain like, you know, this is something that your sister likes to do, but you know, you don't, you can do your own things too. Um, and, and also appreciate that it's, it's great that she admires her older sister and, and she wants to do some things that, that she does. I think it will, it will change the conversation will probably change a little bit every year. Um, as she gets older and they both have different interests or similar interests. Um, but I think as long as your, your younger daughter is also um, saying, you know, um, she's learning her own things at school and she's speaking in her own voice when she's not with her, her sister, you know, that's, I think that's probably going to be okay. Um, so thank you for your question, Latifa. Um, and have a question. Um, I want to know which is better for kids to learn fast, um, telling stories or watching movies. I think that is, you know, there can be a lot of benefit um, to watching movies because you do get to see the facial expressions that go along with the words. You do get to see um, the actions and like the cause and effect 
Um, so, so there's something concrete there for the children to, to see and respond to. And also as a, a parent, um, if like the vocabulary is a little bit too um, difficult, you can always say to them, or, or if the story is like totally out there and it's hard for them to connect it to their experience, um, you can also focus on the facial expressions for like, oh, wow, he looks really worried. Oh, look, like he's, he, they really love each other. They're, and, and you can make the faces together and, and play it out. That might be a way to, to really, you know, sort of bring it to life for them and for them to understand like the words of all the feelings and also like the cause and effect, like, oh, like that person had a car accident and now they're sad <laughs> or, or, you know, these people were sharing and, and now they can, now they feel really happy. Like, how do we show we're happy? So you could turn all of those movies into a game, which I think is something also that the, that the kids will do. Like they'll start repeating the words over and over sometimes, but, um, and they might really like that. It might be a ritual that kind of calms them. So it might be hard to break into, but um, you, you can bring a little bit of life to that by like acting it out with them or changing the voices a little so they can play with it more and it can become more interactive. Um, See, so, you know, I have a couple questions here, so I'm going to get to both of you. Um, so I'll see. So is it easy to teach children in a playful method using rhythmic songs? Um, it really can be. If you have, um, you know, children also, if you have like anything that you can use as a drum for a rhythm, I mean, there is a lot of natural rhythm in language, and that can also help the children just to attend to the sounds of the language um, and to help them pronunciate. Um, it's also, um, you can sing about things that are happening like in the room with you, or you can have like songs that maybe like people in the family sing, you know, when you're going to bed and like all, all of those things, like you can add in the words. Children also love to take a very familiar song and change the words. Um, so we did this constantly um, when I was working in preschool, like just to have a really simple song that we repeat and then change one word over and over because it's so funny. It's the funniest thing in the world and it's very motivating for them to try to come up with words. And that's, that's also a really good skill to help remember vocabulary, just to like remember to pull that word back out of your mind when you want it. So yes, use all, all the singing that you can. You can also um, practice turn taking when you're singing. So you can sing something they can repeat and it's a conversational pattern. And this helps the child like learn to um, attend to different language cues. Like when, it, when do you speak? When is somebody finished? How do you know when it's your turn to talk? Um, that, that can be really helpful in a lot of ways. So yes, use all the music you can come up with. Even if they're just playing music, it's still gonna be helpful for language. Um, let me see, we have a, another question here. Um, so we have talking about a four-year-old who started talking late, but now she's speaking, um, um, but it's still difficult. I'm, as I see, is to ask for what she wants. Okay, so this, this might be, um, there might be a lot of things going on in this situation. So, from what I understand from this question, there is um, a little girl and she's been starting to speak, but at home she will cry instead of using speech. Um, and then she is not always using the right word. Like if she wants water or food, she will say duck or apple. Um, so she might need both a little bit of help with the vocabulary, um, just reinforcement with that vocabulary in a very casual way. I would make sure you're not doing that at the most intense moment. Like if you're if you're having a moment where um, the the little girl is crying and she really wants the water and you know she wants the water, this is not the time to say like it's water, say water. <laughs> like um, I would try when when she's really calm and play play a game. Like this is the water. Oh, it's it's so good to drink. Do you feel like having water now? You don't want water. Okay. Like this is, you know, have like the picture of water and every once in a while you can ask her, wait, what is that? Oh, it's the water. Okay. Um, make sure she has some playful, enjoyable ways to practice those words and that she also knows that, um, and give her a chance to like hold, hold the water and say like, what do you want? And she can say water and make it a really enjoyable interaction that's comfortable. I'm, I'm wondering if there might be a lot of tension around, um, these interactions. Also part of, part of it is that like um, 
every time we learn to do something that's independent, it's, it can be a really happy, empowering thing. It, it can also be a little bit sad because now like, you know, we're not the baby anymore. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's okay to recognize that like, you might also be able to, to tell this little girl like, did you want a hug? Do you want a hug? And then you can tell me what you want because they might, sometimes kids think as they become more independent, they can't have that connection anymore. So it's okay to say like, we will still hug you. We will still love you. We will still help you, but it's good for you to learn to ask for things. <laughs> so um, I would also teach her to say like, I want a hug. And that way she can um, have a hug or she can have a high five or something. So she knows she's still getting that emotional support because she might be using um, the crying instead of speech because she wants um, to be held or she wants to know that like her relationship with mom isn't changing. Um, so that I, I would do both of those things. Give her a little more practice with the vocabulary in a very calm setting and also teach her how to ask for, you know, affection or emotional support in, in whatever way she likes. Um, and, and hopefully that will help her through that transition. Um, let's see, I see Sidra has, oh, okay, we are now having to get to the end. Um, uh, is, do we have time for Sidra to ask her question really quickly? Okay, um, I don't know if Sidra can unmute and ask or if we must go <laughs> immediately. Um, okay, so I'm saying here that we have to close the webinar. Um, I'm going to put my email address um, into the chat. Uh, if you have other questions that we didn't get to, you can feel free to contact me um, and I will get back to you when I am able. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. I hope it's been helpful, and um, I hope you have a, a wonderful evening wherever you are. <laughs>